The American story is one of land. Exploring, seizing, claiming, owning, prospering, loving, losing the land. Success in America chases after land as a double helix, coiling ever upward, more land, more success, paralleled without intersection or satisfaction. Success is an impermanent construction, and land is never really ownable. The interplay of these fraught partners, humans and land, is also the centerpiece of adventure stories. Montana in Lonesome Dove, Tafiti in Moana, and in human origin stories, the Garden of Eden in Abrahamic texts, the Black Hills of the Lakota Sioux. In The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell writes, quote, The regions of the unknown, desert, jungle, deep sea, alien land, are free fields for the projection of unconscious content, not only as ogres, but also as sirens of mysteriously seductive, nostalgic beauty, end quote. The land is everything. The hero cannot succeed without it, but it will still be the land whether the hero succeeds or not. In mid-July of 2003, Matt Parker and his horse Smokey had weathered a large swath of the Nevada desert, basin, and range. But the next couple weeks would test his understanding of what this extraordinary place meant to those who claim it. Prosper with it, love it, and lose it. This is Ride of Passage. I'm Laura Weber Davis. Chapter 5 Promised Land. A chapter in three verses. Verse 1 Pine Creek Ranch. The ADT was charted on BLM land and then eventually Forest Service land. Federal lands interlocked with private lands in this stretch of Matt and Smokey's journey. It would mean that Matt would need to use more than his gazetteer to find his way to water. He would need the help of those who owned the private lands, the ranchers. The ranchers that I experienced were very reserved people. And that's a, that's a compliment. They're often people of few words. They were very giving. They would never refuse you water. I realized in Nevada that it was sort of an unspoken thing where if you refuse somebody water, it can be akin to condemning them to death. Like it could be akin to killing them. No one does that out there. You don't do that to somebody because the distances are too great. That's Oz Wickman, who put Matt and Smokey up for a few nights. You get out here in Central Nevada and you get to run on these dirt roads and you drive by somebody that's in need. Your name is M-U-D Mud locally. At that time when I crossed Nevada, this is in now 2003, it was the hottest month on record. Now we've probably since surpassed that many times over, but uh, it was it was not uncommon for days to hit 120 or something like that. I what mean, does that feel like as you're riding for you and Smokey, especially him being a black horse? It feels very hot and very <laughs> sweaty. Uh, I had a camelback water reservoir on my back for, mu- for much of it, and then I had two smaller canteens, so I could carry about a gallon and a half of, of potable water for myself. Smoky, obviously, I had to find water. I remember even, you know, for the water drops that I did use, when I would cut the top off of this acrylic uh, bottle, which which held five gallons, I would always watch him, you know, put his nose, like, all the way to the bottom, like, almost up to his eyeballs. And then you could just watch the water just go down and down and down and down and down. 
The value of water was deeply felt in Nevada beyond Matt and Smokey. It was central to the plight of the ranchers he met, and for one rancher in particular, Wayne Hage, the owner of Pine Creek Ranch, the next stop on his journey. Matt had been told by trail organizers to be careful on Wayne's land, all tangled up in federal lands. He was a fairly famous or infamous rancher, depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to the U.S. Forest Service, it's infamous. If you're talking to his other other ranchers who, who feel it necessary to defend their interests, then he's famous. And I think Oz was like, yeah, you'll be fine. Like, did you call ahead, though? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, then you'll be fine. Well, what brought me here was, uh, number one, uh, this ranch had always had a reputation for being probably the best ranch in the state of Nevada economically. That's Wayne Hage in an oral history he recorded in 2006. Uh, the ranch was uh, actually started in 1865. Never expected it to be for sale, but uh, the previous owner um, had some uh, problems relative to splitting up the property among uh, various uh, family members, and they just decided to sell the whole thing. So uh, I came in and bought it. Pine Creek Ranch. It covers an area approximately 1,100 square miles. That would be roughly 760,000 acres, give or take. But only about 7,000 of those acres were privately held. The rest of the 750,000 acres were federally held lands on which Wayne had grazing rights for his cattle. That was according to state law in the time of purchase. The question of access to and use of this land would become the centerpiece of Wayne's public life. And so I met, he, I met Wayne, and then I met his youngest son, whom they called Little Wayne, because it was Wayne Jr. But he wasn't little at all. He was like my age. I bring the horse up, and I had no real... He didn't. I didn't see... Um, a hitching post or anything like that. And I remember on his barn, there was like a, a hook. I took um, my reins and I kind of just threw like a casual loop over one side and he was instantly ticked. <laughs> instantly ticked. He's like, what are you doing? You know, like, get that off of there. You know, and I was like, sorry, you know. as It was like, you know, improper that I had done that. And, and in hindsight, I'm, sh you know, maybe it was. Uh, I really don't know. These are seasoned ranchers in an unforgiving area of the country, in an unforgiving area of the world. I wouldn't expect them to think much of me either. You know, I, I think that, I mean, these people are dyed in the wool ranchers dealing with life and death and the elements and everything else. These people are not people you want to screw around with. But at any rate, he, he ended up inviting me inside and we sat and we talked for a while. And eventually, like, he, you know, he, he warmed up. You know, we would sit on the front porch a little bit and we, uh, after dinner and we chatted up. Like, so show me where you've been and where you're headed and things like that. And so we, I spread out all my maps on his, on his uh, kitchen table. Many of the worn pages of Matt's gazetteer maps were of Wayne's land, both the land he owned and the federal land he claimed for grazing and water rights. Somewhere along the line, he had gotten on the wrong side of the U.S. Forest Service, according to him. The Forest Service uh, came in and laid a claim to all of our water rights, water rights that we owned legitimately under state law. And uh, at that time, I said, wait a minute, uh, you know, I own these water rights. That gives me control of the grazing lands. I own the forage out there, too. And uh, the Forest Service and the BLM, and when you, when you sue one of those agencies, uh, you end up suing the United States. So the case became known as Hage v. United States. So here we were with the United States claiming they owned all the water and forage on this range, and my, myself claiming 
that I owned all the water and forage on this range. The court ruled that all of my water right claims for stock water and irrigation were valid, and uh, the court uh, didn't recognize any of the claims of the United States. That's the simplicity of the case. It was a big deal, and he had his office in his home was full of legal books. It was a it was a thing, you know. And so he explained it all to me, and and he was bitter, like he was with just, the government. Yes, he hated the federal government. Wayne was spitting mad, like he, you know, you crossed the wrong cowboy. These legal battles would continue after Matt and Smokey headed out of Pine Creek Ranch. The ranch, the land, and the litigation would pass to Wayne Jr. Before they left, Wayne told Matt that they were welcome to stay the night at a vacant homestead on his property many miles east. When Matt arrived, he found the remains of an entire ranch life, an untouched home with all of the trappings of daily living, covered in a thick layer of dust and sand. Saddles in the tack room, toothbrushes in the bathroom holders, a full model train set, a highly detailed hobby world just vacated by its conductor. This remote land had become too much or too little for the people who had once lived there, or for anyone else. Matt didn't know the details, but he was unsettled contemplating them in his mind. Verse 2, Hot Creek. You know, after a long day's ride, I knew that I was heading toward Hot Creek, which was the, which was the next destination that I was trying to get to. There was a land just ahead where two creeks would run, one hot and one cold. The creeks meant water and life lay ahead, but no map could convey this land of milk and honey. I remember seeing the valley get more and more lush, and you could see that people were growing hay in some of these areas. And it was very lush. Like, sometimes the grass was like two feet tall. Which you, you know. wouldn't necessarily expect. You yeah. don't expect that in Nevada, especially not where I had just come from and for the, you know, a few hundred miles west of there that where I'd ridden over. And then all of a sudden I start seeing these cottonwoods and aspens and it gets, you, you start walking into like a forest, you know, like a, but not a pine tree forest, like a deciduous forest. It's kind of oasis. <laughs> it was. It was so alluring. It was that you're, you're uh, spot on. It was an oasis in the desert. And I remember going through sort of this shady area, and I start hearing the sound of water, like, flowing. And I see these man-made terraced, like, ponds that are catching water that are coming out of, like, sort of the north side itself. And I'm just like, where am I? Like, this place is just magical. It was just, like, absolutely magical. I, I remember I was riding down a row, I think, of, like, really large arborvitae. And this dog darts out in front of us and starts barking at us. And then all of a sudden this very nice voice, you know, starts calling to the dog and a girl steps out and like it was like right out of movie she was like she looks and she's like where are you headed cowboy like what's going like what's going on and i'm looking around going where am i like what like <laughs> where like where is this place that i have like stumbled into and that's when i met tanith i had not been on the ranch a week and here comes this cowboy and this horse just randomly walking through. It was very random. This is Tanith. And he was very nice. He's like, hello, my name is Matt. This is Smokey. He told me what he was doing. Um, and the first thing I could think of is like, do you need some water? And I, uh, he's like, no, I'm fine. And I, I had a feeling he wanted to stay. He was just looking for a place to stay. But I, I was by myself. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to just 
let some random guy who's walking through the property. <laughs> so I, 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 I pushed him along to the uh, ranch below. Tanith had just graduated from college and was convalescing at her parents' remote ranch, away from school and the city and, well, boys. She'd just been through a breakup. Was there a part of you who, when you saw him ride up, think like, I mean, of course, just my luck. I'm in the middle of the desert, and here comes a boy who's exactly my age riding up on a horse. Yes, that was exactly my thought. I'm like, are you kidding me? It hasn't even been a week, and here comes one trotting up. I'm in exactly my age, cowboy. I'm like, oh, goodness. I never pressed to get a lot more information, but I know that the break that she was taking there was important to her. Tanith was on her own journey. Her trail would take the form of good books and mountain breezes. She would feed the animals at the ranch, tend to the garden and orchard. Nothing to do with random cowboys. And so she sent Matt two miles down the road to a kind neighbor couple. And they invited me in. I I put Smokey out in the field in front of their house like with grass, you know, like up to his belly. And he was like, all, he was also like, we should not leave. We should not be leaving here. This is a good <laughs> place. Let's stay. You know, so he was he was happy as a clam and just had some really remarkable time with with their family. And they had a bunkhouse and they had a paddock. And, and what I came to find out is what most of the residents in Hot Creek had is they had a bathhouse because they would all the residents had created their own little bathhouse out of the hot creek and the cold creek, and they had a a heat exchanger to make the the water less deadly, you know, so you could get in there and you wouldn't cook yourself. And they had constructed this beautiful, like, Swedish bathhouse. It was so alluring, and I was still... that, That eventually, after a couple days went by, that I really questioned whether or not I should just pack it all up and stop the trip altogether and just stay there. Like it was, it was just such a unique place with some very, very cool people who lived around there. Do you think that feeling of maybe I should just stay, whether it's fleeting or not, was based off of the hardships that you'd already experienced and like maybe I just don't want to go on anymore? Or was it like... It was partially that. Yeah, yeah it was partially that and partially the hardships that I knew awaited me considering I was only halfway through the second state out of 15 states or something, you know. So it... So the idea of it was like, well, you know, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Matt joined the couple at a community picnic. Tanith was there. They met neighbors who lived many miles apart but shared a common culture. They talked about their own journeys. After the picnic, Matt and Smokey stayed with a family up the road who lived in a rehabbed stagecoach station made of sandstone. They, too, shared warmth and laughter and good conversation, a veritable potluck of joy. The day before Matt planned to leave this ethereal land, a fellow journeyman showed up at the stagecoach stop in her truck. Tanith came to pick up Matt for one more hang at Hot Creek. And after she and I had spent a little bit more time, um, she said, hey, do you want to go up and see the see the lobsters? You know, so I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tanith showed Matt these cobalt blue lobsters that her parents were raising in the perfect waters of Hot Creek. My stepfather, being a fisherman, just had these big containers um, of blue lobsters that were alive and they... They thrived in the temperature of the water that was there. It was a joy. It was an absolute pleasure. Like Everything about that entire visit was great. They went swimming in the pools of the creek and talked about their plans for life and the future. I remember we made spaghetti. The movie Signs was on. And we, so we watched that together. And we went to bed. And... But it was one of those moments where I can honestly say that nothing happened between the two of us. Like nothing that, you know, anybody might want to impart onto this story. There was nothing 
like that. This connection was not about romance. It was about two people on separate journeys. And it was very pure and very simple. And I'm like, and I'm going to stay true to what I was trying to do that summer. And was trying to, like, get away and take a break and, and be there for myself. And for whatever reason, leap of faith or, or good judgment or just trust or divine intervention, I don't know. But it, it worked out to be sort of one of the more magical moments of the entire trip. And I think she still has, like, pride of place in my, in my memory as being this amazing young woman. The next day, she she drove me back to where I was, uh, to you know, to where I'd left Smokey, drove away, and and that again was like one of those sort of sad moments because I knew that I was going to be out in the out in the sticks and I was going to have to ride to Duckwater, which was going to be a much longer ride. And I see her driving away, and I'm I'm there, and all you're hearing is just the sound of the wind, and Smokey just sort of pawing, you know, around in the paddock. And there's none of the laughter, and there's none of the people. And it all just felt like a dream. And I felt utterly alone. Like, I just was looking around, and there's not a soul alive for what feels like a million miles in any direction. And I'm just like, okay, you know, back in the saddle again. Verse 3, Duckwater. Matt and Smokey left the stagecoach station east of this Eden in the evening to avoid the inferno ahead of them. Back into the desert they rode, two nights and a day. They were headed to Duckwater Shoshone tribal lands. Matt had heard many people who had hiked or biked the American Discovery Trail had wonderful experiences with tribal members in Duckwater. But he didn't meet those people. Matt was instead connected at the community picnic with a ranch family that was not a part of this tribe. Alan had a ranch adjacent to the reservation. And my interaction with him was not a fun one. So when I got there, it was the middle of the day. Um, you know, sun straight up in the sky, super hot. And I parked my horse, I parked Smokey kind of off to the side in this shade grove of uh, cottonwoods. I basically just sat there for a few hours. I remember he had a sprinkler going in their backyard and I kept moving the sprinkler around because it was just like making a puddle in like one spot. And eventually... He pulled up, and I I was standing sort of out in the front yard waiting for him. You know, I think I had a smile on my face, like, waiting waiting to greet him. And before the car even stopped, his door was open, and he had hopped out of it, and the car was still coasting. And he started cursing me up and down. You know, who the hell are you on my property? And, you know, it's just like, beep, 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 beep. You know, you'd have to beep out the whole conversation. (laughs) And I'm sitting there, you know, very apologetic, saying, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, and like I, I was told to come here. My name is Matt Parker. I'm riding across the United States. And, you know, it's like, I don't give a beep who you are, like, you know, like just going off on me. And I still to this day could not quite figure out exactly, you know, how this, ha- you know, how it happened, why it happened, why he was in such a bad mood. I mean, like, I don't know, but he came out hot, like he was hot. After just a little bit, he, he like he sort of calmed down. He went from like 11 to a nine. And I said, look, I've, I, you know, I've been riding across the country. I just rode from Hot Creek to here. And I just said, look, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to get some help. Like I'm trying to figure out where to get, where to pick up this next trail. And he, I put my maps on his, on his hood and he was like, you stay right there. And I said, I said, could I trouble you for some water? I said, my, you know, my canteens are empty. And, and he was like, I'm going to give you to the count of 10 to get the, you know, get the bleep off my property. 
and I and he just like wasn't conversive at all. And I said, okay. And then, like I just walked over, you know, got on Smokey and and started riding away. And he came, he had gone into the house and he came out with a shotgun or a rifle. I can't really recall. For real? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Hundred percent. He came out and and he was just looking at me, you know, as I rode away. Um, I knew that I had a water drop from my dad someplace out there. It was, you know, a few miles away at least. And I didn't think I had it in me necessarily to get to that water drop. But, Mm -hmm. you know, when somebody pulls a gun on you, you'd find you have it in you to do a lot of stuff. (laughs) So I, uh, I got to that water drop and, um, just camped out there that night. It's not even an unspoken rule. I mean, it's sort of a rule of the West that's certainly abided by in Nevada that to refuse anybody water out there is like tantamount to killing them. You but, know, but, if, and he didn't offer you any water. It's not a question of offering. When I asked, he refused. Can I read something to you? Sure. This is from his obituary from last year. Mm-hmm. It says, Alan's life circled around horses, dogs, hard work, family, and friends. Each summer, Alan took some young kid waiting to work on a ranch and gave them on-the-job training. He coached them on how to start colts, sort pairs, trim a horse, change a tire, weld, and any other number of jobs on a ranch. Known for his gruff approach, he was patient with those who wanted to learn. But if you should have known better, he'd let you know. <laughs> I guess he felt I should have known better. You know, I, I, I guess that's the, that's, the only, that's the only reply I have for that. Um, I guess he, he felt I should have known better. The American story is one of land. Exploring, seizing, claiming, owning, prospering, loving, and losing the land. The land is everything. The hero cannot succeed without it. But whether or not the hero succeeds, it will still be the land. On the next ride of passage, Matt and Smokey's partnership is threatened. To get my horse out, I remember I walked, I'd walked up, they'd padlocked the paddock so I couldn't even get my horse out. That's next time on Ride of Passage. I'm Laura Weber Davis. Special thanks to podcast editors Rachel Ishikawa and Ronia Kavansag. The Ride of Passage theme is by Bob Scon. Thanks for listening.